Um, feel free to unmute and ask questions uh, along the way to help with the program and help uh, get input from everyone. So with that, I will turn the program over to Dodie and Bob. All right, you all are in for a treat. Just give you a little background on Bob. Bob Hilvers first took up the art of bonsai as a hobby, as many of us, and then found it and offered pleasant diversion to the rigors of his job. His passion for the art soon turned into an avocation and finally it became a second career. After 30 years in public safety, Bob accepted the position of curator of bonsai at the prestigious Clark Center for Japanese Art and Culture which at the time did not have a bonsai collection nor any facility to house one. Bob, along with Bob Bill Clark, the founder of the Clark Center for Japanese Art and Culture, established the origins of the Clark Bonsai Collection in Libby Clark's Flower House. When the Clark Center ceased operations in 2014, Bob was instrumental in the transition of the collection to GSBF and the subsequent relocation of the collection and construction of a new bonsai exhibit and maintenance facility in the iconic Shenzhen Friendship Gardens in Fresno. All the while directing the relentless effort to build the Clark Bonsai Collection into what it has become one of the finest public bonsai collections in North America. In October of this year, Bob will celebrate 21 years as curator of the Clark bonsai collection. Bob is a charter member of the North American Consortium of Bonsai Collection Curators and is past president of the Golden State Bonsai Federation and currently serves on the board of trustees of that organization. I've recently had the pleasure of working with Bob in the planning of the upcoming GSBF Bonsai Rendezvous. It quickly became apparent that he is uh, he is quite knowledgeable regarding bonsai cultivation, as well as event organization and planning. Bob makes his home in Visalia, California, where he lives with his wife, Candy, a Boston terror named Zoe, and a ragdoll cat named Molly. We are in for a treat tonight. What we're going to be doing is sharing um, some short videos that are also on the Bar Clark Bonsai Collection YouTube channel. Um, there, there's many more videos there than that what, than we're showing tonight. And then Bob will offer um, more history, background knowledge, and, and information. And he really does want you to ask questions. Ask questions about the videos or other things that have come to your mind regarding bonsai. Uh, I'm pretty sure if you ask the question, he'll have the answer. So without further ado, Bob, well, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Thank you. Good, good evening, everybody. I'm glad to be here. Um, we're going to be watching a series of these, these videos that we created for our website. Um, they're not actually what you would consider the traditional instructional video uh, that you might see the umpteen thousand other bonsai experts in the world producing. Uh, we, we produce these little videos essentially as promotional uh, items for our membership for the garden there uh, and and for consumption by folks with their personal devices so most of them are quite short uh, and have a very limited there are little vignettes uh, so so they Dodi kind of picked out the ones that she thought that you guys would be interested in and so we're, we'll just kind of show these, these little short vignette videos uh, about some topic of the, of the Clark Bonsai collection, uh, and then kind of have some dialogue or question and answer in between, if that works for everybody. Well, let me show the first one then. Welcome to the Clark Bonsai Collection in Shenzhen. As you enter, we would like to tell you a little bit about the Bonsai Garden. When the world-renowned Clark Center for Japanese Art and Culture in Hanford closed its doors, its founders, Bill and Libby Clark, wanted to continue their mission to share with the public 
their vast, exceptional collection of Japanese art and therefore donated it to the Minneapolis Institute of Art. The center's bonsai garden structures and 100 bonsai were donated to the Golden State Bonsai Federation with the express purpose of their partnering with Shenzhen Friendship Garden to establish a new bonsai garden and to keep the collection in Central California. With the generosity of donors and the hard work of volunteers, the garden opened to the public in October of 2015. The winding pathways feature a hide and reveal design, which focuses the visitor on stunning examples of the art of bonsai, yet hints at the hidden beauty around the next curve. Traditional Japanese music adds to the serene ambiance, and you will be greeted by a docent who will be happy to answer your questions and tell you about the current exhibition. In keeping with our museum heritage, a focused selection of 27 bonsai from the now over 130 world-class bonsai in the collection is presented in themed exhibitions to provide our visitors with new perspectives and a greater appreciation of the art of bonsai. We hope that you will enjoy your visit and be inspired to come again. Okay, Bob. I uh, lost your ear. Let me see. Okay, here I am back. Uh, when we're, whenever we switch from video to, to the Zoom, I lose the picture. Um, we're kind of proud of uh, the of the way um, we constructed the the um, visitor exhibit area because it's it's rather intimate. It's much smaller than the other two collections, the other two GSBF collections, as far as um, uh, the size and the number of trees that we, we keep on display. Uh, but as you can see from the video, they're all on uh, individual um, pedestals. Uh, we did that intentionally at eye level um, for people to enjoy bonsai as art um, and so that they could enjoy individual bonsai uh, rather than just kind of look at a, you know, a lineup of bonsai on a, on a bench somewhere and that the, the garden itself is designed to pull people through. There are, a, a, it doesn't kind of play well in the video, but there are a number of path choices that people can make after they walk through the gate um, and to, to, see, to see what interests them the most. But they can only see about two or three bonsai at a time before they have to walk a little bit and go around the bend they know it's there. They can kind of see through the screening or the other bushes that there's something else to see. So that the, the display itself actually is a little kind of organic engine that draws people along to enjoy things as they as they tour through the, the bonsai exhibit. And, and the, the paths all come back, pin back on one another so that you'll, you'll all always end up seeing all the bonsai um, by walking all of the paths. So it's a, it's a, basically a traditional stroll garden uh, with the bonsai being the, the, the median, you know, the, the, the secondary foliage in, in, a, in a bonsai garden, in a garden rather than the, the ground cover and the trees and then there's shrubs in the middle. Um, the bonsai act as the middle shrubs for folks to stop and enjoy each one of them. Um, we do, we, because we came out of an, a, a museum environment, we tend to, to present everything in a museum sort of way. Um, all of the trees have uh, information cards attached to them saying what their species are, who the original artist is, uh, how it came to the collection, who donated it. Um, and, in, and in many of them have what we call extended information cards that have much more information. Uh, just recently, we've gone to QR codes so that folks can use a, you know, the little QR code symbol you see on your groceries so that the cash register can keep track of what you bought. And uh, we're using QR codes for folks and their smartphones so that they can flash the QR code and get additional information in the form of the little, sometimes very short one or two minute videos. It's very similar to the ones we're gonna see tonight about individual trees. Um, 
We do some other kinds of things that, that other bonsai collections don't do. Um, we don't have the entire collection out at, at, at once. We, we're over 140 trees now, uh, and we kind of keep it at that level. It's about all we can manage with the resources we have and the space we have available to keep them. But um, we, have, we have a collection within a collection of what we call legacy trees. Those are all trees that were done by Japanese Americans, um, in particular because many of them are, are living history. Uh, a lot of times they're not the best bonsai art, um, but if we're a museum that's, that's kind of keeping the cultural and historical aspect of California bonsai art alive, uh, we need those particular examples of how uh, the art was, was practiced in that time, particularly just prior to World War II, during World War II and after World War II, all things Japanese were suppressed. And uh, these folks were practicing the art in camera. They were doing it at home. Um, they didn't have um, access to traditional tools or materials or teachers. Uh, a lot of them had grandfathers or uncles or somebody that taught them uh, and they learned from them. Um, but, but those bonsai, if you've been around the art long enough, are, are recognizable. I don't, I don't know if it, it, it would be right to say they're a style, but they're recognizable in how those guys did art, uh, did the bonsai art that way. And so we try to preserve those, uh, those legacy piece, pieces uh, in the style that the original artists did them. Uh, and that's controversial with lots of folks. Uh, the, the ethos that, that comes from Japan about what you do with a bonsai is as soon as you got it and it's old, you restyle it. And we don't do that, not with, not with the legacy collection trees because they're, they're too valuable to us as, as living history of the art. So, so we do some different things than, than other collections do. All right, ready for the second video? We're gonna watch now, it's a tour of the, of the gardens of uh, some individual trees. I think you're gonna enjoy it. What you see here is a bald cypress. Uh, they're referred to as bald cypresses because they are one of the few coniferous varieties of trees that lose their leaves. They defoliate, they're deciduous. One of two that we have in collection. Um, this one has acquired a nickname, some of our trees do. Uh, our visitors call this one the swamp monster because of its large size. Uh, and it was actually collected in the swamps of Florida um, and converted to the use as a bonsai. It's also considered one of the finest bald cypress bonsai in existence. This elm uh, is one of my favorite in the collection, not only because it's a very fine bonsai, because it has a really interesting history. It was originally a, a landscaping tree, um, and during a construction project, it was removed. In fact, it was pushed out of the ground by, by a bulldozer and ran over and thrown up on a trash heap to be discarded. Uh, one of the members of the Fresno Bonsai Society saw it, uh, went to the job site, asked to, if they could have it, and planted it in a pot and saved it. All of the branches grown on these two trunks that were broken uh, when the bulldozer ran over it have been grown on since it was created as a bonsai. This Texas cedar elm was collected in the wild uh, and is a true elm. It's a it's a Omus crassifolia doll. Uh, that's the species. Uh, but the interesting name of cedar elm comes from the fact that locally um, they are always seen growing in the wild in association with what the folks in Texas call cedars, which are really not cedars. They're junipers. Hence the name Texas cedar elm. What you see here is a uh, forest grouping or forest planting of trident elms. Uh, as with all of the trees, it has a little bit of a backstory of its own. Uh, the second largest tree in this group was imported from Japan. How that was done and how it ended up in this group, we're not sure. The rest of the trees in the grouping were all 
uh, propagated from cuttings from the original tree so that all of the leaves have the same size and same shape, uh, which can happen differently if we were to use uh, plant, trees planted from seed. So, so to achieve the image of, of these trees all related, they are. Uh, in addition, this, this tree, this grouping was restyled by Ryan Neal uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and one of the trees in the group was removed. And we took that tree and created a raft style with it. Uh, and it's in a bonsai right over to my left here. And we'll be talking about that soon. This raft style bonsai uh, started out as one of the trees removed from the Trident Maple Forest group that Ryan Neal restyled. We decided to try to utilize that tree by laying on its side. And all of the little trees that you see in this group are the branches that, that grew up from, from the trunk. This mimics a uh, phenomenon in nature where a tree gets blown over in a windstorm, uh, falls on its side, all of the branches on the crush side die, but the branches on the upside will survive if the trunk roots. So we have done that with this particular tree and created a rap style. This camellia bonsai is a favorite of our visitors. In fact, it gets fan mail every year, uh, particularly after the blooms come out. It's a double blossom, big pink ones, and this one is covered with buds this year. So about Christmas time, this is gonna have a very uh, dramatic show of pink blossoms. This also has a bit of a history. It was once a, a landscaping shrub in somebody's yard, uh, but when the uh, Freeway 41 widening project was done several years ago here in Fresno, uh, it was grubbed out of the yard uh, along with another one uh, and saved and, and used as a bonsai. The other one did not survive the process uh, and this one did and we're very fortunate. We have, it's your only camellia that we have in collection. This needle juniper is a sentimental favorite with those of us that have been connected with this collection for any length of time. It was the original bonsai donated to the Clark Bonsai Collection uh, when, when we, we built the collection. Uh, it's also one of Bill Clark's favorite bonsai. It, at the time it was at the Clark Bonsai Collection in Hanford at the, Han at the, the Clark Center for Japanese Art and Culture. This bonsai always sat on the pedestal immediately to the right of the entrance gate. And it's the only bonsai that isn't changed out when our rotations. So every 90 days we, we rotate the trees and collection on display so that when visitors come they get to see something new. Uh, but by tradition and, and for sentimental reasons, this one remains on display uh, when, when all the others get changed out. Uh, I can remember back uh, when the collection was at the Clark Center, uh, one, of, one of Bill's favorite pastimes was to wait till the end of the day when there were no, no visitors on the property and the, and the museum gallery had closed for the day. He would come to the bonsai collection and just wander a collection all to himself. Uh, and if he saw something that he was interested in or had a question, uh, I would always find a little note in my inbox in the morning when I came to work uh, that Bill wanted to talk to me about something having to do with the bonsai collection. And one of my first tasks was to go to his office to find out what he wanted to know about something he'd seen when there were no visitors around. <laughs> this little princess persimmon is also a, a favorite with visitors and another of the trees in the collection that gets fan mail every year primarily because of the display of tiny little bright orange persimmons that it usually is covered with. This year, we didn't get a big crop, um, but we did re save one little tiny persimmon uh, on this tree, just so that folks could understand why this rather innocuous looking tree is on display. This forest grouping of Japanese maples is one of my favorite bonsai ever not just in this collection, but of all the bonsai I've seen in my travels, this one is one of my favorites because of the artistry involved in placing these individual trees so that they look very random. It was excellently done. 
It's also one of the few bonsai we have in collection we actually know the true age of. This was all planted from seed in 1978. This bonsai is a twisted pomegranate and it's ancient. Uh, $64,000 question with all of our visitors where all of our bonsai is how old is it? Uh, and we don't really know, um, but it's quite, quite old. It was originally owned and styled by Ralph Breen, who was uh, one of the founding members of the Hanford Bonsai Society in 1955, which makes the Hanford Society one of the oldest bonsai clubs in the United States. All right, Bob. Uh, let me get back a little bit. Oh, there I am. Okay. So, so we, we did kind of speak a little bit about the changing rotation of the exhibits. Um, we do that every 90 days. And not only do we just change the trees out, each one of the exhibits that we change to is curated uh, so that it has, it, 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 it's about some aspect of the art of bonsai. Uh, the one that we've got up right now is called our three R exhibits, um, revived, restored, resurrected. And each one of those trees um, has a resurrection story about it that either it was, you know, that elm that was saved from the construction project and run over by a bulldozer is in there. Um, so there, are, and, and so each one of the 26 trees in that exhibit has this, this story of near death experience. And now it's, it's this bonsai, um, uh, past exhibits could have, could be, you know, we've done one on bonsai styles so that we, we curated it so that visitors could look at, at them and, and learn uh, about what a, a bonsai style was and, and how many different ones that we could depict in, in the collection. Um, all, of, all of our opening hours are accompanied by at least one knowledgeable docent. Um, they have to go through a a training process to, to learn about the art of bonsai. And then every time we open up an exhibit, they have to come an extra day uh, where we, we go through uh, on a, in about a four or five hour class and explain all of the history and, and um, the interesting anecdotes about each one of the trees that's on the exhibit so that they can pro provide that to the visitors. Uh, and our our visitors really like that. Um, we probably actually mount our exhibitions with a, a non-bonsai person in mind, whereas m most of the other bonsai collections kind of cater to the bonsai community. Uh, we we kind of go the opposite direction. We cater to the non-bonsai folks uh, and, and uh, we, we're we're slowly but surely uh, building building a, a following now. We're gonna we're gonna see we're we're trending right now to see thirty five thousand people through our gate this year. Bob, uh, I noticed that you have a, a sprinkling system in place, and uh, I wondered if uh, there's something you can tell us about how <laughs> you have to keep taking that apart and putting the new tree in, and and it, so um, it must be pretty flexible and how you monitor it. And if you also, since you have these people coming in there, are they also checking as part of what they do to see that, that the system is working or do you have someone else that's, can, just speak, can you speak a little bit to that aspect well, of it? Well, um, the, the watering system itself is what we call a double redundant mirrored um, system, um, almost in the same way that you would have a double redundant mirrored uh, computer system where you have, Two mainframes or or two two computers running simultaneously to main main make sure that if if the program goes down that one computer stays up and you don't lose you know it's, those are used in defense programs and things like that that absolutely can't have the computer fail uh, with us in in the summertime you know we we see 110 degree days. Um, five or six days in a row in the summertime, and we cannot have a watering system that fails. So it's double redundant uh, and it's mirrored. It's, uh, and so that means that 
there's essentially two um, plumbing systems in the ground uh, and it's looped um, so that every bonsai is watered by two separate systems that are run by two separate clocks from two separate water sources so that if one system fails, it, the other system will, will, will maintain uh, and, and the likelihood that we would have a failure of the watering system for the trees, um, unlikely. Um, however, they're mechanical things and they're made with components that do break. Um, and so uh, when the curatorial team comes to work uh, on the curatorial days, um, at least one of those guys, particularly one of the key carriers that has, has keys to get, get in and, and uh, un, uh, unset the alarm codes, because we have a, a video alarm system that's, that runs in real time so that if there's movement inside the, the bonsai compound, uh, it sets the, the cameras off and the cameras notify a, a live operator and that person just kind of can punch a button and watch what's going on through that camera. So we, we have to turn that system off before we come walking around in there. They call the police on us. Um, uh, so it's it's one of the curatorial team's guys, gals, whoever comes there, there first, if it's not me, to walk the the exhibit and the, and the reserve area, the maintenance area, to check every tree in collection to make sure that something didn't go amiss with the watering system in between the last time we saw them. And the ones out in the exhibit are much more robust and they're on their own standpipes and things don't normally go wrong, although every once in a while we, we do find a problem with those. The ones that we have trouble with are in the reserve area, which are not uh, on a standpipe system. They're on uh, spaghetti lines that have uh, sprays in the pot and the squirrels and all kinds of other things that, you know, one of our one of our most persistent problems is that if we move trees around as in for a, a, an exhibit, uh, we're taking a bunch of trees out of the storage area and putting them in the exhibit area and moving the exhibit trees into the storage area, that uh, inevitably uh, something will not get a watering stake or multiple watering stakes put in them or uh, if we have, have a station where a, a bonsai would normally sit and it's not there, rather than have water spraying all over the place, we, we turn the, the heads around uh, on the spaghetti lines and plug them in backwards. So that plugs up the line. And um, every time we change an exhibit, at least once, we'll find some bonsai somewhere that has a watering stake put in backwards. <laughs> so, so yeah, we do have our problems and, and it's, it's a, it's a people equipment problem the same way as, you know, anything else. Great question. Great. Thank you. Did, did, did that answer what, what you wanted? Hey, that was wonderful. Thank you. I'm glad I asked. Any other questions from uh, uh, from what the trees that you saw in the initial video? I noticed that last tree, uh, the one that you said, uh, uh, I think it was a pomegranate, wasn't it? The uh, it was in a Chinese. It, it looked like it had a Chinese pot. I don't know if you recall that. I started to think. I don't think I are you supposed to ask questions while the video is playing? Probably not. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you can't. I think the last stop. one we did look was 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 an old twisted pomegranate. It's actually in a pretty good sized pot. Actually, we moved it into a larger pot uh, because what it was in was the interior part of that pot was was not large enough, and we were continually having health problems with that tree because the air water mix ratio in the soil wasn't working for 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 that particular tree. So we wanted to up pot it a little bit, give it a little bit more soil and we did. So that the pot, that green pot, I think is, is what you're talking about uh, is actually pretty good size. All right, let's go on to our, our third video. Thank you. 
Bees are Yamadori California junipers. Yamadori is a Japanese term that is literally translated as mountain dove. In the practical application, it means native plants that have been collected from the wild and used to create a bonsai. Stunted wild trees battered by the elements, starved of nutrients, and then collected from the mountains of Japan and China for the first bonsai. First and second generation Japanese Americans transferred this tradition to the Americas. All of these bonsai are the result of influence of Japanese Americans on the art. Collected wild trees are the most valued for use as bonsai because nature has already imprinted them with the mark of age and the visual language that defines their life struggles. Trunks are twisted and bent. Old scars, dead stubs, and broken branches attest to the struggles of a dynamic environment. The deadwood is bleached by harsh sun and scoured by blowing sand and ice crystals. In the early 1950s, when bonsai enjoyed a rapid expansion of interest in the U.S., Japanese Americans pioneered the practice of collecting wild junipers from the high deserts in California to be used in the creation of bonsai. The practice of using Yamadori plant material for bonsai continues to this day, and the most esteemed bonsai are those created from Yamadori. This California juniper has a special history. It was collected by John Naka and Professor Howard Latimer of Fresno State University over 50 years ago in the Sand Canyon area of the Apaches. Because of the special provenance of this tree, we've elected to try to restore it to John Naka's original styling concept. Images of the original artist's concept are studied to ensure that the results of the restoration will be as close to the original artist's vision as possible. As you can see from the photographs also that there was a little bit of an angle change in uh, the time since this was originally depicted in the sketches and how it sits now in this pot. So we're gonna rotate this a little bit forward to capture that original angle and we're gonna change pots. Here at the base of the trunk, there's a significant uh, amount of old rot that has been repaired. Uh, originally, John covered this with some sort of filler material back in the day. That's long since deteriorated away since this thing was collected 50 years ago. Uh, and we're just gonna leave it like it is. We think it looks okay. Up on the top of the trunk, there's some significant deterioration of the dead wood that was an original piece to the composition. We don't feel we can sacrifice that and retain a likeness of the original composition, but we're going to repair that. Once all the work is completed, our goal is to have a replica of John's original sketch of this tree. Not all agree with this, and many professional bonsai practitioners feel that the best use of all bonsai material is to restyle them periodically to the highest possible aesthetic value. We here at the Clark Bonsai Collection believe it is part of our mission to retain as much of the original artist's conception of these trees as possible because they represent a living record. Okay, we're back. Are you there, Bob? I'm here, yeah. Oh, perfect. So the question I've been having since watching these is, how do you preserve the dead wood? What is the process? <laughs> we well, we jiggle some beads and you know, <laughs> cut open a calf on a rock and pray to the gods. And, you know, dead the dead wood preservation is is not a real complex procedure. Um, there's no magic potions or you know. Uh, we we simply um, it's a it's a stinky, messy, drudgery kind of job. We use uh, toothbrushes and water to scrub the wood um, uh, diligently. That's a that's a really important to scrub the wood down to the bare wood because anything that 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 was either collected in the wild and not treated before has hundred years worth of grime and muck uh, attached to the wood. If it, if it has been a bone tie before and it's been treated with lime sulfur, uh, then that all has to be rubbed away until you get down to the bare wood. And, and um, when you use the water to do it, we use little, little spray bottles and, and a toothbrush. 
uh, and we just don't give it the once over. We actually scrub it until we get down to, to bare wood. Um, that that re reveals a lot of character in in the dead wood part of it, where there's there's age checking and some of the parts that are revealed to have some really punky wood, where you you need to pay particular attention to to some some other processes involved. Uh, you have to get all of the dirt and the grime and all of that gunk off of those things. Um, and so that's probably a, the most time consuming uh, but important task in, in the dead wood preservation. Uh, and then uh, when the, while the wood is still moist, not, not wet, not soaked, but moist, uh, then we treat it with lime sulfur. Uh, with, as, with as pure lime sulfur as you can get your hands on nowadays, which is sometimes of a problem. Uh, and then that has to dry. Uh, that, ha that has to be bone dry. And so we're talking a multi-day multi process here where you have to, you know, by, by the nature of what, what you're doing in scrubbing, scrubbing the wood with a water and a toothbrush, uh, and it gets absolutely soaked. Uh, uh, and then letting that let, letting the water run off of it and, and still have moist wood to treat with the lime sulfur. Uh, and the moist wood will absorb lime sulfur much better than dry wood will. Uh, and so that, that's, that soaks that chemical into the wood where, where we're trying to preserve the wood from the pathogens that attack the wood. Um, and then that has to dry. That has to be bone dry. And then we'll follow it up with a wood preservative. Uh, in that order. If you do the wood preservative first, then that soaks into the pores and the cells of the wood and it prevents the lime sulfur from penetrating. And that's really yeah. the, the thing that preserves the wood uh, from the pathogen. Um, we've also discovered that when we put the wood preservative on after we've done all that other work, there's no need to, you know, tint or color or something um, some, some way treat the lime sulfur to get the silver look to it rather than that, that chalky white look that, that dried um, lime sulfur, is partic particularly if it's really high concentrated lime sulfur kind of gets chalky white. Uh, if you want that nice natural silvery looking uh, dead wood, um, it, when, when you treat the, treat the wood after, after the lime sulfur is dried with, with the preservative, it, it kind of gets that naturally. So that's, that's our process for doing, doing dead wood. What do you use for wood preservative? Uh, we, we use um, Minwax, Minwax okay. wood, wood hardener. Yeah, there's any number of products that you can, that you can, you know, we, they all work pretty much the same. They're almost all the same chemical composition. You can get the, the uh, two, the two part epoxy ones where you have to, you know, combine them. Um, but it's, we don't, see that as working any more efficiently in, in terms of preservative of the wood than, than the wood hardener. Wood hardener is easy to come by. It's easy to, to, to use. It's less expensive usually than the most than the other stuff is. Uh, if there's a problem with the Minwax, it's the can itself is when you screw the lid back on, sometimes you can't get it back off um, because the, the, ah. the, the wood hardener kind of seals. So what we've done is, um, you, if you you know you have your your oil that you use for your pots, whatever that turns out to be. And I mean, we use camellia oil, uh, but you know, butcher block oil, min mineral oil works just just as well. It, whatever oil you have around for oil in your pots is, you just take a, a bit of it on a on a rag and rub the the rim of the bottle, the, the metal can, uh, with the oil. Uh, that that makes it easier to get the lid off the damn thing the next time you want to use it. Yeah, Vaseline. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Thank you. And how often do you have to uh, treat Deadwood? Um, the answer is as often as it needs it. Um, in some cases, um, particularly with us and, and most everybody that I know with bonsai, um, we tend to kind of uh, blanket water. You know, when we when when the, the watering self, the system itself, uh, particularly the, the binary system, is one circuit is um, drip, uh, a seep line, and the other circuit is micro sprays. Uh, the drip line actually um, penetrates the soil, uh, and the micro sprays um, kind of kind of uh, 
fill the, the pot volume with, with liquid uh, so that it resuscitates the soil. It, it, it pushes all of the waste gases out that the roots produce um, on a 24 hour basis by displacement, water displacement, those gases get, get flushed out. Uh, and then when all of that dries up or the plant uses it or drips out of the bottom of the pot, then fresh air comes into the soil mass. Uh, and that's, you know, if, if there's some secret to bonsai, that's one of them, is that, that we, we're supercharging uh, the soil with, with air uh, for the roots. And that's how we get vibrant plants in containers. Um, does, did that answer the question? You did, but then you also opened the other, the, that door to the soil and the oxygen and, and the water and all. <laughs> uh, Bob and I had, I had the pleasure of talking with Bob about this a couple nights ago, for a couple hours actually. It was very interesting. <laughs> so I think you could expand upon that actually, if you would. Oh God, you know, I, mean, I, I need to go to bed sometime. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of misunderstanding about um, about how soil with bonsai works. Um, the, and and at, at the Clark Collection, we use inert soil mixes, a Japanese style inert soil with based on Akadama. And I'm not here to say that, that if you plant, if you're, if you're doing bonsai, you have to have Akadama, you don't. Um, but if you do have Akadama, then you, you kind of have to understand how it works and how best to use it. Um, but, but in general, um, it's important to understand that plants, particularly potted plants, once I has a potted plant culture, so we have to pay attention to that, do not take up liquid water. You know, we all have this assumption that, that the roots are, are these, you know, kind of straws that you stick down there until it's wet and you can suck up the water. But plants actually take water up at the molecular level. Um, if you think about that for a minute, and, and you know, I'm, I know I'm going to leave some people behind, uh, it's a good thing that, that we're, we're not in the same room where I can look into your eyes because some of your eyes are going to roll back into, the, into your head and, and a couple of them you're actually going to get up and go over in the corner and throw up because what I'm telling you is so, so foreign to you. Plants do not take up liquid water. They take up water vapor in the form of water, water molecules. Uh, so, so the water actually has to get to that state so that the, these tiny little fine hairs on the white roots, with, which are the active part of how a tree takes up the water and nutrients, um, can do that. Uh, so so they, the water has to be reduced to, a, to the osmotic level so it can be consumed by the tree. It does that more efficiently if there's a lot of air in the soil. How we get a lot of air in the soil is these very frangible soil mixes that we use that allow air, air to penetrate the soil mass. Um, in, in how inert soils work is that they don't have a whole lot of, of organic material. In fact, they don't have any organic material in there to kind of interfere with the air spaces in there. So if you've got lava rock and pumice and some akadama or all akadama or all lava rock or however you want to do that, there's still a lot of air around those soil particles uh, that allows the tree to breathe. And when you water, um, you displace, if you completely flood the pot, you displace um, waste gases that the roots actually produce uh, in favor of the water volume. It just, there's no air in the, the soil mass anymore. It's all water. And as the water leaves, either through use, use by the tree, the tree takes it up or it drains out the holes or it evaporates, then air comes back into the soil mass uh, and you have this, this kind of 24 hour resuscitation of fresh air into the soil mass and is accessible by the roots of the tree. Uh, and that's one of the engines that that really allows us to have these very healthy plants in, in a foreign environment. They, don't, they, didn't, they didn't evolve in a pot, they evolved in the ground. Um, and so that's, that's one of the ways that we, we have these, this very efficient process for using soil. Um, and you don't have to have Akadama to do that. It's just, if you're, if you're using Akadama, then 
I think I think the Japanese wouldn't use it if they could if they could find something else because it's expensive. And so they're 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 the ultimate pragmatists. They would use something cheaper if they could. And the reason they use Akadama mostly in Japan, uh, and we've we've copied that without really understanding why, um, is it's predictable. Um, with an with an inert soil um, mass, uh, nothing that that goes into that pot uh, is is not introduced by by the the grower. So it's ultimately predictable in terms of uh, how how to to uh, understand what's going to happen if you put fertilizer in there, if you feed the plant, and exactly how much is going to produce what effect on your plant if you understand what the root system is like and you've constructed that carefully. Um, um, with with organics, uh, you can actually act, actually get a higher performance, um, believe it or else, with organic soil mixes uh, for a period of time, um, but it's unpredictable. For example, if you put organics in the soil for about the first year, um, that really doesn't have any benefit to the plant because the micro microorganisms that have to be introduced to the to the soil mass haven't flourished enough and haven't haven't matured enough to start breaking down the organic material. So what what happens is about the second year uh, you get the benefit of having organics in the soil, and that will continue until that's exhausted at, at lowering levels until at some point in time the soil is exhausted and and the uh, the organics have broken in, down into muck and they're plugging up your drainage holes and that kind of crap. Um, but Akadama doesn't do that. Um, what If you want to feed the tree and you want to know exactly how much growth you're going to get from what you're putting in, in you need an inert, inert, inert soil mix to begin with. Uh, so it's, it's ultimately predictable uh, if, if everything else stays the same. Um, there is some notion with folks that that Akadama breaks down and it does does the same damn thing as as uh, organics do, and so you're changing your soil mix out anyway. And that and it's not ac accurate. It it breaks down in a different way than the organics do. Um, uh, water action on top of the soil mass uh, for exposed Akadama will actually break the Akadama on the soil down into mud, um, but it's only at that that level. Um, a half or three quarters of an inch of, on the top of the pot. In the pot, Akadama cleaves because it's it's a crystalline clay structure uh, that that forms in these microscopic plates. Uh, and so, as microscopic root tendrils penetrate that that component, that my, that that Akadama component, it will cleave in a straight line. Uh, and so what, what the benefit of that is, is that you have these ultimately cleaving root systems that the Japanese believe, and so do I, reflect in the top of the tree so that if you want these very nicely ramified branch structures, uh, the roots have to look that way too, and Akadama does that in spades. Does that, does that make sense to everybody? <laughs> I just have a point of clarification. So what is the opposite of inert soil? Something with organics in it. Okay. And like I said, they work just fine. I mean, they, the, the plant plant will grow well in organic soil mixes. It's just that the soil behaves differently inside the, the container. And so ultimately what we're all after is a very vibrant plant. Um, and um, and that's achieved by this nice air water mixture inside the container um, so that when we've got the right mixture of, of water um, of molecularizing so that it can be accessed by the tree as easily as the tree needs it um, and supported by the ability of, of fresh air every day to rush back into the soil as the water drains away or is used by the tree. And we've got this perfect little engine that resuscitates itself every 24 hours um, and, and promotes these very vigorous trees. I know, I, I don't, I know that sounds kind of counterintuitive and it, it's pretty foreign maybe if it's never been, a, you've never been exposed to that kind of sort soil theory before, but that's that's how it works. 
Now I have a question as far as watering. Um, I probably tend to overwater. Is a tree adequately watered if, if, can you assume the tree is adequately watered if water is coming out of the holes of the pot? No. No, okay. How do you determine Be a tree is properly? Well, it depends on the soil mix, you know, how, you know, you need to kind of understand how you made that soil in, in that pot to begin with, because it's possible for the water to just run straight through and not inundate the entire soil mass. It doesn't, you know, there, there could be parts of your pot that aren't seeing any water. It's mm -hmm. just going straight through the pot. Um, but that's how, that's dependent on the soil mass itself and how it was constructed when you, when you transplanted. So but, are you saying like if you did a 50, 25, 25 or 40, 30, 30? It so doesn't have a whole lot to do with the soil component mix. It has more to do with how you arrange the soil when you transplanted the tree. How do you arrange soil? Make sure that, that there is soil in contact with every single root okay. in the soil mass. Chopstick it. Well, not just chopstick it, but there's a specific way to do that. You know, I, I used to hang out with the, with the old Japanese guys down in LA. Um, that had this notion that that you didn't have to tie a tree in with wire. You just chopstick it so that the soil was packed in there so tight that the soil would hold the tree in the pot. And and they actually made that work. I'm not quite sure how, but the soil was so potted and so so tight in there it wouldn't drain. <laughs> so, but but they were very proud of how well they could chopstick the soil. <laughs> I don't know enough how to so, so yeah it's it, it there's more there's more to the pot root tree relationship than we kind of all kind of give credit for you know we're all into give me a pair of scissors and some wire and i'll make a bonsai when when the reality is give me give me the pot and and the correct soil mix and let me let me get at how that root system is arranged in the pot and i'll make you a bonsai the so Bob, the clipping part comes after. Bob, uh, now I know that some people are fans of putting um, a heavier, larger, uh, what you might call drainage layer, and then yeah. layering the soil to find yeah. your components. Is that one of the things that you are advocating? Yes, um, it it certainly is. It and it and you know. One of the things I encounter with folks and why they get so frustrated and, and, and every once in a while, somebody will get just damn, downright mad at me because I'm telling them something they don't like or don't understand or is contrary to what they think they know. That there's no silver bullet. <laughs> Everybody wants that one right answer. If I do it this way every time, that's how my bonsai are, you know, they're all going to be magazine cover bonsai. And, and the reality is that it's situational. How big is the pot? What do the roots look like? How old is the tree? Is this the first time it's been transplanted? What's the soil mix? What's your climate? What's your backyard like? All of those factors go into determining how best to craft how you plant a tree in a pot. And pe people just that, uh, and they kind of throw their hands up and say, my God, I, 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 didn't, I didn't want to build a rocket to the moon. I just wanted to plant a bonsai. But, but it's, it's, all of those factors have to be taken into consideration at, at some level um, to ensure that you're you're having success. I, I would say probably if there's a single observation I can make about transplanting is that we do it too often. Does the size of the particles in the soil make a difference? It, they do, it exactly do. Um, there's, you can, um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with, you can get shoheen size soil, you know, smaller particles uh, for smaller pots uh, because that, that mix stays moister. It's a wetter mix um, because those tiny little pots kind of dry out quicker. Um, but if you use uh, that mix in a larger pot, it will stay too wet um, and the tree will suffer for it. It doesn't have good air water mix. It has just water because, because those little particles hold too much water too long and, and don't allow air to, to, to invade the soil so that the, the roots can access it. So, so yeah, it makes, it makes a difference for the soil particle size. It sure does. Nice, thank you.
Well, anyway, I know you're out there. I can hear you breathing. Huh? <laughs> or or may, maybe maybe at, at, we're we're the victim of, of talking too much soil yeah. theory and I, I hear and, a question. Yeah. Uh, hi, Brian. Um, I was kind of wondering what if you could talk a little bit about your management style down there at the garden, how you were an all volunteer ar army, obviously. So <laughs> how how many challenges you had this year, particularly about getting personnel on there and managing these people to come and come and go and and all those challenges of that management. We did we we have had some significant challenges last year uh, when when we were restricted with with uh, the safety measures for COVID. It does sorry folks that's that's a medication induced that I people haven't been beating me. Um, <laughs> Um, when, when COVID-19 originally hit and uh, the city that owns the park that we're located in uh, shut the park down. Uh, and when they did that, we couldn't get access to the, to the bonsai. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And, so, and so until we could, could have, and, and the city was, you know, doing what any political entity would, would do and covered its ass. Uh, wasn't, you know, well, I'm sorry, you know, we can't let you in. This is, you know, the governor's mandate, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and we had to have a couple of sit down meetings with them in rather short order um, and explain to them that if we didn't have people getting into the collection to, to maintain them, that, that we were going to turn a half a million dollars of bonsai into dumpster fodder pretty quickly. Um, and so it didn't hurt that I looked looked at the governor's order specifically and it went read through it completely line by line and found uh, a section near the end of the executive order that said museums could be exempt uh, for, for certain reasons. And I said, we're exempt. You need to let us in. So they let us in, but we couldn't drive in because they were not allowing any vehicles in, the, in a 500 acre park and the bonsai collection is kind of in the middle of the park. So, so our, our guys had to park a mile away in a, in a shopping center and hump their tools and whatever else materials we needed to take care of the bonsai in uh, by walking into the collection. <laughs> I, I, we, 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 we call those guys our secondhand lions uh, that they would be willing to do that. Also our, our docent core, uh, which we're absolutely dependent upon. We can't, we can't have the collection open when we don't have docents. Um, we do get considerable benefit from their presence in there because they, they explain things to people about bonsai. And like I said, our, our visitors really like that part of it. They come back again and again to get those stories. Um, but but they were totally decimated. Uh, so we're we're in fact right now just starting to rebuild our our docent core, um, and, and like we have to have them in there for security reasons. We can't have the trees unattended. Um, people do all kinds of wacko stuff. Um, we have a tea house or a facsimile of a tea house with a tokenoma in it that we display. And one of our docents was out in the reserve area, which is connected to the exhibit area. She stepped back there for something. I don't pick up a tool or something. It then stepped back out into the exhibit area. And there was a guy on the roof of the tea house taking a selfie. <laughs> Jeez. So we, we have to have, have people. And so we're rebuilding that core of people now. The, the, the curatorial team, the, the folks that actually touched the trees, uh, actually stuck with us. Most of them did. We lost a couple of guys. Um, but we're, we're rebuilding that. And we meet um, every Wednesday and every Friday for what we call curatorial work days. And that's when we work on the trees. Does, did, does that answer some of your question? Uh, it's just, I was just wondering how you managed with your personnel over this last year and what a challenge it was at first probably. And then it might, be, might become a little bit easier as the year went on. It did. Uh, as soon as we got open back up, it became easier for us to, not only to access the trees so we didn't have to walk in from a while away, we could start driving back in. Um, and fortunately, um, since we've been at the Shenzhen, 
for five years now. Uh, and all of those folks that are on the curatorial team mostly come out of the Fresno Bonsai Society, but not all. We've got some folks that are just walk-ins. Um, they're, they're not part of a bonsai club and didn't have any bonsai experience, which curiously enough, makes some of our best best helpers because they don't have to unlearn bad, bad habits. Um, so we're rebuilding that group of people. Uh, and um, Dave, over this this period of time for five years have become extremely adept uh, at, at the advanced techniques it takes to maintain the collection at a, at a fairly high level. Uh, I, I think you may have noticed in some of the videos that we looked at that, that some of the, the junipers didn't look all that great. I mean, their foliage management has suffered. Uh, and so the, that's one of the things that we've been concentrating on of late. Uh, and the guys, are, the guys are getting pretty pretty handy at doing juniper foliage. So, so it's a matter of um, providing a, an educational opportunity for them to advance their skills and, op and function at a higher level, which, which they do now, uh, and retaining them and, and actually recruiting new folks to, to do that sort of thing. Uh, and it's a constant challenge. Uh, one, of our, one of our problems is what are we gonna do about me? I'm timing out, I'm, I'm, I'm falling apart. Uh, and we need, we're, we're gonna have to find a curator here pretty quick. Did that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, you answered all the questions, but then it begins into another realm, which is fundraising and how are you, how are you, how are you managing the money and all that stuff? How's that coming along? Well, um, we're, we're, we essentially live um, by uh, earned income. We do have some donors, but, but not enough to keep us, keep us uh, in the black. Uh, of late, um, so particularly after we were reopened after the COVID, um, we, we kind of had our little pop-up gift stand, which we sell little tchotchke bonsai, little $20 bonsai in plastic pots, little junipers, um, just take off. Uh, and uh, since, oh, since we reopened in the spring, uh, up until about now, uh, we couldn't we couldn't keep those little bonsai in stock, and we we've, we've done quite well with them. So so we we do well with earned income through our pop up gift shop, for lack of a better term. But that's not going to get us where we need to be. Uh, if we we're going to reach some sort of financial sustainability, where we're not having to live hand to mouth, which is not sustainable, uh, we're going to have to teach ourselves how to chase the big money, um, and we are in fact doing that right now. We just hired uh, a part-time volunteer coordinator uh, so that we've got more staff on, on board to take off, take some of that kind of day-to-day um, -day management things of keeping staff going uh, and allow me and, and my assistant to, to look at marketing and, uh, and donor development, that sort of thing. Excellent, Bob, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Well, let's look at the next video. It's part of your three R series. Oh, is it? Oh, okay, good. Yeah, cool. the cork bark pine. The cork bark. Oh, okay. We have one of those? Yeah. <laughs> As we continue our little tour through this particular exhibition, uh, this is another one of our pines that we hadn't had on display for years and years. It's a, it's a corticosa, cork bark pine, nishiki in Japanese. Um, and we, we discovered uh, when we moved to the, the Shenzhen Gardens from the old Clark Museum, that uh, a lot of our trees got exposed to pathogens and pests that they just didn't have to contend with when we were at the Clark Center. Because out there, we were pretty much surrounded by farmland uh, and um, because of the agribusiness application of chemicals to, to, to control pests and disease, uh, we just didn't have to contend with any of that. When we moved here to the Shenzhen, uh, all of the trees became exposed to all of the pests and pathogens in the urban forest. And in particular, what happened to our pines is they were attacked by borers. And it was extremely difficult to, to, con to deal with it because we wouldn't know that a borer had, had gotten into the tree until we lost a branch. And so we lost some major branches on this cork bark and we were really concerned. Um, 
Although this is not a, a large tree, it's by far a really excellent example of a, a Nishiki pine. Uh, and, an, and a unique feature about this particular one is that most Nishikis are grafted. They take, a, they take the Kotakosa scion and graft it to black pine roots because the black pine roots are much stronger than the Kotakosa roots. Uh, and that's pretty common. And what happens is on almost all Nishiki pines, uh, you'll see that there's a call, there's a, there's a reduction. So we, so we end up with a, with a reverse taper or, or just a, a really noticeable uh, uh, collar right where that, that uh, graft occurred. This tree was never grafted. It's on native corticosa roots, which is unique as far as I know. I don't know any other uh, Nishiki black, black pines that are that way. And we're back. Oh, you here is Bob? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Yeah. We have a question. It asks if you have a YouTube channel. We have a website that has a link to the YouTube channel oh. where all of our videos are. Okay. Does that, yes. does that answer the question? Yes. If you and another, another reason that these videos mostly are fairly short uh, and some of them are seem to have a little bit more of a of a focus than others is that we did a series of them for the Japan Foundation about that's where that one video about the Yamadori trees came from we did three others in that series um, as part of a grant for the Japan Foundation about the contribution of Japanese Americans to the art of bonsai in California so there's there the the impetus for a lot of our videos is different some of them are 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 simple promo you know look at us aren't we shiny and some of them actually had had a, a reason behind them when we we made them bob i wanted to just make a comment i saw uh, michael haggardorn had a posting that he's got this new student uh named carmen that's gonna come and she's had some experience curating uh are, are you aware of various people who are at stages of development where they would be at a place where they could be mentored to, for you to develop them into, you know, because, you know, we need somebody good if you leave. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'd like to have somebody good and we haven't had that yet, but we're hoping. <laughs> um, I don't know that that particular person we are kind of looking um for for someone the problem is who the hell wants to move to fresno uh secondly we don't have the money to pay somebody to move to fresno uh who would work for what i'm working for they're they don't exist um so our first problem is to rectify our um financial situation so that we have the where wherewithal to do a head hunt for someone that would like to take on a collection. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot of attendant problems to finding a, a curator. Um, maybe as mentioned, I think at the beginning of the program, I'm part of the National um, Consortium of Bonsai Curators. There's exactly 20 of us in the whole country. <laughs> so it, it represents a little bit of a problem um, to, to scare up somebody we're probably essentially going to partner if I were to look into my crystal ball on how this is all going to work out and, and if, I, if I don't fall down dead beforehand, um, that we'll partner with the Shenzhen to um, create a funding source that we can hire a garden manager that they need uh, and uh, probably a part-time curator for the bonsai collection that would work for the garden manager uh, and the curatorial team will have our prop might be there now, uh, skillful enough so that, that they can, they can do a lot of stuff that, that, that needs to be done without, you know, immediate direction. Does that, does that make sense? Yes. Maybe not. <laughs> no, it does. It does. Uh, I want to show the, uh, Juniper video next. Which Juniper? <laughs> 
the Sierra, the California juniper. Okay. I'm here with this California juniper. This one does have a little bit of a special history and it does have a resurrection story to it. Um, this one came to us from the National Collection in Washington, DC. Uh, at the time, um, this was the only uh, tree that was in collection at the National Arboretum uh, that was, was uh, gifted to another collection. Um, and the reason that this one came here is that uh, California junipers don't do really well in Washington, D.C. Uh, this, this tree originally had two trunks, uh, and I think we do have some photographs showing this second trunk with foliage on it, uh, and that just died while it was at D.C. So at the time, Jack Sestick was the curator there. He called me up and said, Bob, how'd you like a, a, a tree from the National Arboretum? And I said, sure, we'll take it, uh, and tried to work out how we would get it shipped. And here's where the resurrection story comes in. Uh, Thank you. We shipped it overland by a freight company in DC who packaged it up and en encased it in a, in a structure of clear plastic and, and, um, and Sustake and the crew at the National Arboretum uh, put special uh, foam soaked blankets over it so that it would stay hydrated. You know, we did everything we could because the shipping company said it would take three days to get it from DC to Fresno. Took 10 days to get from DC to Fresno. And in that time, the tree desiccated severely. So then we had to try to resurrect it uh, before I had to call Jack and say, you know, uh, your tree didn't arrive alive. But long story short, we did manage to, to get it uh, uh, hydrated and resurrected. Uh, we lost some foliage and some branches, so we're in the process of, uh, of, of uh, replacing uh, the foliage pads on this design. This is about as close as we can get uh, to uh, the original design as it was depicted in, uh, on display in, in Washington, D.C. Um, the California connection for this, this particular tree is this is an, an old Ernie Pope tree uh, that he donated to the National Arboretum, and it's, it's back now in California. We're, we're happy with this tree. Okay, we're back. Bob, I forgot to ask questions on the uh, cork bark pine. Can you hear us? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I forgot on the previous video you mentioned about the boars. Um, yeah. What what have uh, what have you learned about treating uh, various pathogens? Well, with the borers, uh, in particular, I mean, we, we, we had a number of challenges with stuff um, before the video started. We were talking about um, sexually transmitted diseases in plants and fire blight. <laughs> but with, with the pines, we, we have about mm, 15 pines in collection, Japanese black pines, and one Monterey pine. Uh, in fact, it's, a, it's maybe the finest Monterey pine bonsai because it's Yamadori. It's not a... It's not a nursery plant, but with the with the pines, we we had almost come to the conclusion that we would not be keeping black pines in the collection, uh, and we're talking with the BGLM in Huntington about shipping our pines to them uh, because we couldn't keep the borers out of them um, because every every pine in the urban forest in a you know a 500 acre park had had was infested with borers and and try as we might to learn the, the, the life cycle of when they were active and you know what to, what to do to interrupt that. I mean, we, we, we hung up the little traps and, and treated stuff when we thought they were active and you know, sprayed the bark twice a week you know, with, with pretty nasty insecticide, hoping that they'd land on it and commit suicide and just you know, we got the ag department in to try to explain to us what they knew about the life cycle of borers so that we could try to figure out a way to keep our pines in collection. And it wasn't working. Uh, we were, we were losing, losing branches and losing trees. And we said, there's no point in, in risking uh, bonsai in a, in a collection that can't keep, keep the, the bugs out of them. Uh, and then we came across a product 
uh, called Bio Advance Three in One Shake and Feed, or I don't know. I gave I gave the information to Dodi, um, and it's a systemic, uh, and it's for trees. Um, and so we started using this systemic on the pines um, because that way it doesn't matter if a bore chews into the pine. As soon as it gets to the phloem, it's a goner. It, it, that 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 insecticide uh, gets into the sap of the tree and then the, the, the larvae chews on it and that's the end of it. Um, so we haven't had borers for two years since we started using that. Well, I'm going to type in the product uh, in chat. Uh, what about fungus, uh, spider mites? Uh, the spider mites, <laughs> you know, that stuff works for spider mites as well. Uh, we were having a hell of a time with spider mites because we couldn't, uh, you, you need to, you know, you can get miticides that will kill the adults or the crawlers, as we call them. Um, but, but mites have this curious life cycle um, that they're, they're hatched. You know, they hatch out of the eggs um, pregnant. <laughs> they, 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 they reproduce immediately from, uh, upon uh, hatching out of the egg. So you kind of have to catch them right as they hatch. And if they've got a staggered hatch going on, you can kill some of them, but not all of them, unless you use an oviside. And even with the oviside, you've got to get it so that the egg is in a certain state of, of development so that it can be penetrated by the oviside. And so you're, you're constantly spraying to get these cockamamie little critters out. And we live in, in mite heaven. Where, where the, the, you know, we've got this humid, humid environment with the bonsai uh, coupled with high heat uh, in the summertime and, and the mites think they've died and gone to heaven. And we were having a hell of a time uh, keeping them out of our shimpaku uh, until we started using this mites, this, uh, this systemic that we used for the borers and that gets them too. So the way we treat, if we, if we notice that we, we have mites or we think we have mites in our, in our, uh, clumping junipers or, or, or shimpaku or, or toigawa, um, we will spray uh, to kill the crawlers, the active ones that are, that are alive. Uh, and uh, miticide will get them. It, 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 does, it works as advertised. Uh, it just doesn't get the, the eggs. Uh, and so then, then we, we put down the, the, um, the systemic uh, and as the new ones hatch out and then they bite into the tree, that, that gets them. And so we, we found that combination to be very effective. Um, with the funguses, uh, God knows how many of them there are out there. Like I say, we're in the urban environment. So whatever's out there, we get two on our trees. Our number one line of defense is a healthy tree. Uh, the healthy tree is dependent on the on air water ratio in the soil, in the pot. So we're, we're very cognizant about what, how we do that. Um, um, and if, if we have a, a sick tree or a constantly recurring problem with a tree, the first thing we look at is not what we spray on the leaves. It's why is this tree weak enough to allow a pathogen to get to it? Uh, and we start there. Um, but m our, our kind of go-to uh, for, for the funguses are, are um, sulfur. Uh, and in some cases, we may go to daconel or some other fungus, fungicide specific. Uh, and if we get a real persistent problem, let's say be, be, when we can't transplant the tree, if we think there's a, an air water problem with how the, how the soil mass is working, uh, and we just kind of have to keep the tree alive until we can transplant. Um, we'll sometimes rotate um, the sulfur and and some other um, uh, mite or uh, fungicide, uh, coupled with removing diseased foliage, uh, and we can keep it under control. Uh, and um, eventually, what what we find is if we can keep it under control until we can transplant and and rectify whatever the air water problem in the soil is by next spring everything will be fine we we used to lose things to to fungus and we don't do that anymore
we don't lose stuff to funguses. We had a question on how often do you use that bioadvance? Do you use it on all the trees and how often do you apply it? No, I don't, we don't use it on all the trees. Uh, some, some elms are, are um, don't get along with systemics. So we don't put it on, we don't use that systemic on anything uh, that's deciduous. Uh, it goes on the pines um, specifically for borers and we put it on the, um, on the shimpaku for the mites. Yeah, man in Roseville just uh, got arrested for child porn. Really? I, I guess it's more prevalent. Um, I didn't. I didn't hear that question. It wasn't a question. Uh, oh. This is my ignorance. You said sulfur. Is that the same thing as copper well, sulfate? I'm, copper sulfate. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I didn't mean sulfur. I meant copper. Okay. Yeah, copper sulfate. Okay. I have so CRS when disease. When you have a, a sick tree and you're transplanting it, do you ever use a wooden box or how do you change Sometimes, the... yeah. Sometimes if we feel that, that there's a there's a real problem with uh, with um, root rot or some kind of um, problem with with the soil itself, um, and we need um, not to put in a in a in a ceramic container into a clay container that sometimes with a box, you can actually get more air into the air mat, air, air soil water mix into to the container. Also with a box, um, you can, if you're, if you're clever about how you construct the box, you can actually expand or contract the soil mass inside the container itself so that you can you can fool with that ratio until you get things just right. Uh, Vince, Vince knows about that. <laughs> I believe that. I believe that. All right, well, let's look at our next video, which is the one of the other restorations, a live oak. Oh, okay. We've done a video on this particular tree before. It's on our website. Uh, this is an interior live oak uh, that came to us uh, near death. It was um, very uh, weak. Um, it was actually producing leaves and producing buds, uh, but, the, but the buds never matured. Uh, it was kind of like the tree was in suspended anim animation and uh, we kept losing branches off of it even after it came to us. Uh, and we determined that, that it either had a disease that we couldn't contend with or that it had a serious root problem. Uh, and so there was a real debate about whether we could baby the tree along and try to get it healthy enough to do work on it or whether it would succumb uh, while we waited. Uh, and so we just uh, kind of bit the bullet and uh, took the tree out of the pot and discovered that it was indeed a root problem with a lot of root rot. Um, there was a, a film of, of native clay from the native soil where this was collected uh, up near Bass Lake um, that had completely occluded all the drainage holes in the pot and, and that was the, the problem. So once we got it into new soil, it got happy and healthy. Uh, just this last spring, uh, it, it was he healthy enough, we thought, for us to actually do some wiring on this tree. So now it looks like this big blob uh, uh, on this reaching branch. Uh, and we're allowing it to extend as, as it wants to simply to build bigger in the tree. Uh, so we're not really interested at this point in, in developing individual foliage pads on this arrangement. Essentially what we've done with the wiring is to replicate um, a branch structure on these native oaks uh, that resembles for lack of anything, like a basket of snakes. Uh, there's, no, there's no kind of directionality to, to the branches uh, on these oaks. And we're trying to replicate that with this particular wiring. Once that scaffolding sets, then we can chase down a, a, a more uh, cohesive uh, overall foliage design with, with some directionality about, uh, about this thing, give it some drama rather than just this big green blob on the, on the, on the trunk. But it does also speak to our philosophy that we like to show uh, bonsai in process. 
and, and teach with them, uh, not only to the, to the public, but to both our communities about how, how we achieve a particular design. All right. So I have a question, Bob. Yeah. How do you manage all the repotting needs for a large collection? Say that again. How do you manage the repotting needs for a large collection? Very difficultly. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's it's. I my estimation is transplanting um, is probably the single most important aspect. Uh, of bonsai. If we don't get that right, nothing else works right. Uh, and we don't do as much of it, I think, as other people do. Um, we, we, we tend to keep them in, uh, once, we, once we're sure that we've got a good water air ratio in the container with, with the plant, uh, with the size of the container and, and how the plant is behaving, uh, we don't tend to fool around with that too much. And so we leave them be. Uh, and since we use an, an Akadama based mix, um, it, the longer you leave a root system in Akadama in the soil mass so that you can promote that really fine ramified root structure, um, not only is, is the plant healthier for a longer period of time without chasing chasing roots down and digging them up and cutting them um, but it it promotes a much more um, maintainable foliage mass for its final image or at least the one that you're working on uh, because they don't grow as fast um, they just grow vigorously so you don't have these large uh, extensions in the spring you have short extensions uh, and you can leave those on until you get three or four or five leaf pairs that don't run a foot and a half, they run six inches. Um, so it, it becomes the, how we maintain the soil and how we do transplanting actually becomes a management technique for the foliage. Does that, does that make sense to you? Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's my lack of knowledge and <laughs> not your explanation. Um, I have a question. At what point do you bare root a plant? Um, only when we have to. Okay. So I have, I have a question about your, your basket of snakes um, yeah. style. <laughs> <laughs> so does, does that tree not have like heavier branches, are they are similar sizes? And then what you know, that, happens over time? Um, it does. Uh, some, several of them ha have died on there They're, or were dead, were dying when we got it. Um, and so we, you know, more of them died while we were dithering around about whether we would kill it trying to transplant it or not. And finally decided, yeah, we're just gonna die anyway. So we're gonna transplant it. And then we put it in the greenhouse. Um, and, and that, video didn't it didn't photograph well in that video so you couldn't see much of the structure uh for the primaries but yes it does have primaries and they're all kind of in the right spot um but it's it's this big green blob sitting on this kind of arm reaching branch and it doesn't have a whole lot of of what you would call dynamic directionality in terms of of you know being a sexy bonsai um but it, right now we're glad that it's happy uh and it's and it's and it's doing well uh in its new container um and uh, we're building we're building the scaffolding that will support um the, the foliage mass and foliage pads when we start to chase down a, a design for that tree so so it's in process um as mentioned in the video we kind of do that a fair amount of the time uh, we tend to like to, to show trees in process. So a lot of times when we have a tree on exhibit, it won't be a finished bonsai. It will have some sort of technique, uh, development technique being applied to it. Um, and the docents are all trained to explain what that technique is and why we're doing it. 
Um, and and we find that our visitors really really like that as well. Does that help? Did that answer yeah, your question? You. I just, yeah, I just wondered for the health of the tree, I thought it'd be better if everything was going up and out for a while. It, it, it is. We, we're, we're letting all of the, all of the uh, tertiaries and, and the terminal buds, we're letting them all run. Go, That's okay. one of the reasons it, it looks kind of amorphous as it does is because we're letting all the terminal buds run just and for the health of I the tree. I don't think we could even see the top of the tree from the yeah, way no. it was shown. I think yeah, it the kept background, growing. background okay. didn't help it much, but but to answer your question, okay. yes, we're, allow, we're allowing all of the terminal buds to run. Okay, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Bob, on some of your collected trees that have the original soil, yeah. how do you go about when you try to get the old soil out and try to get the new soil in? You know, Vince, that's a toughie. Um, it really depends on the health of the tree. I, I've seen um, California junipers that, that have been in containers you know, for a pretty long time um, and they get transplanted and they, they fail um, because they don't like to have that done to their roots. Um, essentially what we have to do to transition a, a Yamadori plant, whether it's a juniper or something else, um, is to build what I, what I call a domestic root system. You know, you have to, you have to switch it off. You have to switch, switch brands on it. You have to get it to switch from a wild root system, which with, with most Yamadori junipers is one, one root that runs 10 feet before it has any branching to it, um, and, and convert that to a domesticated root system that's kind of like what you might see in a nursery. And uh, it was with some um, native species uh, that can take a pretty long time and you just kind of have to, to, uh, to, to be patient and um, use, use your skills at, at discerning what the plant is doing by looking at the top of the tree because to, to tear the, the root system apart may do it in. We have a, um, a huge uh, California juniper that's really old. I mean, it, you know, they, none of them come date stamp, so that we don't really know how old they are. And our, you know, our visitors are always like, we have two big questions from our visitors. How old is it? And is that real? <laughs> but we have this, this enormous California juniper that, that um, has no uh, termite runs in it, none. Um, and so really what that means is that the, the wood is so old and so hard that the termites find it easier to bore into someplace else. And so if you can find a really thick, old, gnarled, weathered dead wood on a juniper that doesn't have any termite runs in it, that's old because it's just too hard for the termites to bore into. And that's this tree. And when we got it, it was it had one, one count, one little, little sprig of a bud on it about a, as long as my finger. Um, and uh, we were going to transplant it uh, to see if we could pull it out uh, to get it to save it. And Ryan Neal looked at it and he said, "Now, Bob, you can't you can't transplant this. You transplant it, you kill it." He says, "Tip tip the pot and just let it go." And what what he was doing when he had us tip the pot is that he was adjusting the air water ratio inside that soil mass so that it was drier, so that the water drained out of that pot. Uh, and um, the damn thing pulled out of it, and you know, it, it one of these days when it gets a lot of foliage on it, and it's and it's growing faster and faster each year. It it it's going to be one of really nice tree. So to answer your question about how to how to handle Yanomadori roots when you collect them, you know, there's there's all sorts of techniques. I, you know, Mel Akater used to tell me he didn't he didn't look for roots when he collected. Uh, California junipers. He looked for, you know, how junipers will do. They'll they'll produce those little kind of bud nubs down in on uh, the wood that will turn into roots if you were to cover it with dirt, um, or it will turn into uh, a foliage bud, depending. Uh, he used to look for those on the interior of California junipers and just saw them off, uh, and then put those into pure perlite. Uh, uh, in a under shade cloth to get them to root, and they would. 
uh, when the other guys are out there, you know, diligently with pry bars, breaking granite boulders apart so they can recover 10 foot of useless roots and they couldn't get those trees to survive. So. <laughs> wow. Very interesting. Thank you, Bob. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's watch the, I think probably maybe our last video of the night. We'll see. Uh, this is the Cedar of Lebanon. A resurrection tale uh, on this uh, Cedar of Lebanon was uh, when it was gifted to us by Professor Howard Latimer of Fresno State. Uh, it had been in his personal collection for some years and never uh, transplanted. <laughs> so uh, it was, although healthy and draining, uh, the, the, the tree itself was, had pushed itself up out of the pot with bottom roots uh, about four inches. Um, also, it was in a desperate need of a, of a restyling. Uh, and and uh, this is one of the trees that we, we turned over to Ryan Neal uh, to, to take up to uh, Mirai uh, and uh, work on it in his studio. He, he did a, a, a video with it. Uh, and um, this is a, a cedar of Lebanon. Uh, and these trees naturally, when they're mature, have this very what I would call oak tree shape. Uh, some of our visitors. So, so they, they naturally get this very oak tree billowing kind of branch structure and foliage pad arrangement. Uh, and that's, that's the design that Ryan uh, settled on and we're following with this tree. Now this being, being a, a cedar, um, it does uh, take forever to get wire to set a branch in the right angle. Uh, we had wire on this tree, uh, original wire from Ryan, uh, did, the, did the, the primaries and the secondaries. I did the, uh, the tertiary branch pads uh, and um, the wire started to scar the tree. So we had to take the wire off. Uh, and as you can see, uh, we're correcting branch pad foliage angles right now so that they're all uh, consistent with, uh, with a horizontal plane. Um, and, and some of these are, have kind of become cantilevered. So I, I'm just going through here doing tip wiring and correcting some of these foliage pad angles um, to get to, to restore this thing. And it's also got some, some uh, bud tip extension that we're gonna control. So uh, the resurrection story of this one is that we took a tree that had lost all aesthetic value um, needed needed a desperate transplanting uh, and did that work and and then had Ryan uh, pursue a, a traditional uh, cedar of Lebanon design with it and it, we were very happy with this whole design all right that seemed to tie in to, with the repotting and the, uh, that we were just talking about. Yeah, since that video, I kind of did all the tip wiring and, and actually, as most of us know, you put one wire on, on, a, on a tree and that's not enough. <laughs> you can never do one wire. So I ended up actually having to rewire every pad on that tree to get the pad angles correct. Uh, and then we, we pinched back all of the extending bud lines um, that were in. So now uh, that one is at its optimum uh, aesthetic value uh, for a mature cedar of Lebanon. They're quite striking. Um, I, you can go online and, and, you know, type in your search engine, you know, photographs of cedar of Lebanon. Uh, and you'll see these, these massive spreading kind of oak shaped conifers. Um, in fact, the, 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 the national flag of Lebanon has a, a cedar of Lebanon on the flag, uh, and it looks a whole lot like the one that we've got in collection. <laughs> it took me two days to, to do the tip wiring on that tree. It's massive. It's a big tree. Wow. wow. 
Wow. Does anybody have any other questions for Bob? We there's there's a multitude of other videos that are very good on on the, you can see them either through the website, the Clark Bonsai Collection website, or you can go to the Clark Bonsai Collection YouTube channel and uh, click on the video list. And, and there's quite a few that are very good, um, but uh, he has a lot of knowledge to share. Bob, I do have a question about uh, the, the bio advance that you're using on the junipers and pines. About yeah. how much of the granule do you put on you know, per like say square foot of soil area. You know, we we kind of don't have a, a a square inch surface formula for for application. There is a there is some directions on the container, but we use a tablespoon uh, for application, uh, and so we tend to to you know look at a at a container, a bonsai container, a pot is you know, a one tablespoon, two tablespoon, four tablespoon size pot. Um, and we, we tend to distribute it pretty evenly around the, the outside of the perimeter, um, even though the, the, uh, this particular product is a chemical a fertilizer, it does have like a two one one ratio to it, as well as being a systemic. Um, we, we, have, we have a high, ratio of uh, Yamadori juniper in collection with deadwood that actually interact with the, the soil level. Um, and um, you cannot stop, underline, capitalize, bold, cannot put fertilizer in contact with your dead wood if you want to keep your dead wood. So we're very careful about how we apply the, any fertilizer to, to the, the, the pot um, and it's easier to control using a, a teaspoon. It takes a little bit of time uh, to do it that way. So it really just depends on the size of the pot about what, what the application rate is, but it, it, it's pretty hard to screw it up. You know, you can't, can't hardly do it wrong. Thank you. I hope that, hope that answers the question. Ah, good enough. And Bob, about how often do you do that? Is that a, a yearly, a bi-yearly? Well, with the with the product for the to, to use it as a systemic to keep the borers and uh, and the spider mites under control, uh, they say that an annual uh, application is okay, but that is considering the uh, plant in the ground, uh, which is a different environment than a potted plant, particularly how we water potted plants with watering every day because stuff leaches right through the soil. That's one of the reasons why we kind of, kind of do so well with, with uh, organic uh, timed, time releasing of the little bonsai cookies, the guys in Japan using those little cookies um, because that, that leaches a little bit of nutrient out of that, that cookie every time you water the plant. If you put something down on the soil surface, uh, you may leach that completely out of the soil by watering every day before the chant of the plant actually has a chance to use it all. Hmm. So, so we do twice a year application of the, of the um, systemic rather than, than what the container says, simply because we're watering more often and we're leaching stuff through the, through the pot as water. When it comes to fertilization of normal fertilizer, we use organics. Um, uh, it depends specifically on the species of the plant. We, we, we fertilize the conifers differently than from the broadleafs, differently from the deciduous trees, etc. Thank you. Any other questions? This is the opportunity to pick the brain. I have a comment. Um, I've known Bob for a long time, and I've worked with him uh, with GSBF and uh, observed him as a leader in our community. And I just want to say, this guy is amazing. He has done <laughs> so much, so many wonderful things, and has spearheaded so many different projects and given of his time. And um, the community owes you a big 
thank you. And I hope you're, you get your rewards here and not just in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that announcement. The check is in the mail. <laughs> It's all true. It's all true. So that kind of goes both ways. You know, when I, some years ago, I had a, a medical problem um, with a with a shoulder surgery that that went seriously wrong. I got a, a bone infection uh, that that nearly took my life. Mm -hmm. um, and I was the curator down at the Clark Collection back in those days. Uh, and when my shoulder was, was my arm was in a sling, I couldn't do transplanting and repotting and wiring. Uh, Kathleen and Vince came all the way down to Hanford and worked on the Clark collection when I was not able to do that. It's not surprising to hear. <laughs> I have, I have a, a final question, I think. Any advice you would give to us new bonsai folks? Run, <laughs> run for your life. It, it's, it's lethal to human life, run, run as fast as you can. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think probably the thing I, the, the, this, the issue that I see people probably struggling with the most is, is to reconcile their expectations of what they can do based on how much time and resources they're willing to put into learning the craft and, and the art um, that I, I see folks constantly, you know, putting a minimal amount of effort into to the art of bonsai and constantly being disappointed that their tree doesn't look like a magazine cover. Um, there's, there's a total disconnect um, just it, you have to have to kind of understand what it is that you want from the art of bonsai. Uh, if you want a magazine cover tree, then understand that you're going to have to put that kind of effort into it. Time, effort, learning, you know, talk, talk, you know, put yourself in, in the care of a, of a genuine bonsai professional uh, for the time it takes to learn how to do that. And not all of us are talented enough to do that. I, I my talent is running a collection. I'm not a good bonsai artist. Um, or if all you're interested in is the pleasure of doing bonsai, reconcile yourself to the fact that you're gonna be able to achieve a certain level of success and take the pleasure from that rather than set yourself up as an expectation that you're gonna make a magazine cover tree. It's possible, you know, you can do that. I've seen folks that with, with with minimal training and minimal tools make pretty nice bonsai um, but there's there's this this discrepancy in expectations about what you can do for what you're willing to put into the art sounds like sound advice so i appreciate that is is there something else coming up down there to like an event that you're having what's coming up next you know, normally because of our weather it gets so hot, uh, we're seeing, we're starting to see it uh, taper off of our visitor experience um, because of the weather and because other venues have opened back up. When we were kind of the only game in town, we, we were, you know, we had Disneyland, Disneyland lines outside the exhibition for people to get in. Um, that's kind of stopped now because there are other things opening up and people can go do, do them. Uh, when we get into the really hot weather, uh, we, we, debate every year whether we're you know we need to be closed for you know july 15th through august 30th because during that six weeks it's so friggin hot outside that that you know people don't come visit us except in the mornings uh, and we also have some safety pro protocols in place for our docents that that if uh, particularly because of the fires uh, if the air quality level reaches uh unhealthy range per the health department or if the feels like temperature reaches a certain certain degree outside, we won't let our docents work outside. It's not safe for them, uh, particularly if they're elderly. Uh, and a lot of our team is, uh, and so we close. Uh, and that's you know we put that on our website, and then it causes some problems because we get nasty letters from people saying, "I came there to see your goddamn trees, and you weren't there, you dirty dog." <laughs> 
um, but but in the summertime we we can't you know we're not going to sacrifice our folks for, for that that they, they don't deserve that kind of stuff um so uh as the summer sets in we we kind of pull back our operations um starting in october uh there will be uh uh on the 24th and 25th i think what we call a plain air artist event where we're inviting uh local artists to come in and paint scenes in the garden of of the shenzhen gardens and and the bonsai uh, exhibit area uh and that will be a kind of a two-day festival uh uh and uh, 